This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, where we help women remove the overwhelm of living their most holistic life. This is the place to find evidence-based nutrition tactics, healthy lifestyle and wellness tips, abundance mindset, and easily implementable low-tox living strategies so you can rise up to your full potential and protect your family's health. I'm your host, Stacey Heine certified holistic nutritionist and better living advocate. Now let's get empowered with some simple swaps that make a big impact for optimal wellness. It's episode 17 of the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, and I am so thrilled to have you here from my friend, Chuck Carroll. Chuck is known as the weight loss champion, and you are going to understand why once you hear his story. Let me give you a little bio of Chuck so that you can understand what we're going to talk about in our episode, aside from his food addiction and how he overcame it, and also what he practices now and what he eats and if he counts calories and why he went vegan and so many other things and tips that he has to share with you on how to transition your life if you are struggling with food addiction or are in need of losing weight. So at his heaviest, Chuck was 420 pounds and had a mass 66 inch waist while requiring a size 6 XL shirt. At just five foot six, his tiny frame struggled to support his enormous figure. A Severe food addiction continued to fuel an unhealthy lifestyle as his waist expanded at such a pace that soon it would outgrow even the big and tall category. Yet he convinced himself that he needed to continue down that path in order to remain a personality on radio station Big 100.3 in Washington, D.C. Still, there were times when, like millions of others battling the bulge, he tried and failed to lose weight. He was once even paid to endorse a program called the cookie diet, which we're going to be talking about in this episode. But like every other attempt, the success he achieved was short lived as the weight came pouring back on and then some. The money he was paid for shilling the cookies quickly evaporated at the nearest drive through. Fearing that his life was spiraling out of control and nearing an end, he opted to undergo weight loss surgery. Prior to the procedure, he was convinced that the drastic measure would become like all the other failed attempts to lose weight. At least he thought he could go to his grave confident that he had tried everything. Chuck was just 27 years old at the time and didn't think that he would live to see 30. But then the unexpected happened and he woke up from surgery and never looked back. Although a critical component, the surgery proved only to be the first step in his journey. In fact, he only attributes 10% of his weight loss success to the procedure. In just over a year, Chuck shed 265 pounds by conquering food addiction and devoted himself to a healthier lifestyle. He's now maintained the weight loss by eating a plant-based diet. Going vegan once seemed unthinkable to Chuck, but now it's going back to eating processed meat and dairy that would be inconceivable to him. The confidence he has gained from weight loss enabled him to pursue his dream of being a sports reporter. He has hosted a number of radio shows with NFL players. One of the players gave him the nickname, the weight loss champion. After news of his transformation spread throughout the locker room. Shortly thereafter, Chuck's career took a twist when he became a reporter for the all news CBS station in Washington. From there, he went on to anchor national newscasts at NBC News Radio. Yet, he felt something was still missing in his professional life. He wanted to give back and inspire others to follow his footsteps, whether they had already lost weight or were just beginning their weight loss journey. His journey took another twist in 2017 when he adopted a plant-based diet at the urging of WWE superstar Austin Aries, which kicked his health into overdrive. The following year, he teamed up with PCRM to launch the Exam Room podcast, where he has interviewed the biggest names in the plant-based community, including Dr. Neil Bernard, 
Dr. T. Colin Campbell, and Dr. Michael Greger. The show has grown to become one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts in the world. To date, Chuck has lost an astonishing 280 pounds. I am so excited for you to see Chuck and to stay in contact with him via Instagram and Twitter. But in the meantime, let's take a listen to this epic episode of the Urban Pharmacy Podcast with my friend from the Physicians Committee, Chuck Carroll. Enjoy. Welcome, Chuck Carroll, to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. I am so thankful to have you here. I first saw you when you were interviewing people at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine International Conference in Nutrition and Medicine Conference in 2019. And you were just asking all the doctors all the questions. And you had so much energy. And I knew that I was going to connect with you in some way, shape, or form in my life someday. And here we are. Ah, well, thank you for making the connection. That's so cool. And yeah, that, that conference name is a mouthful, isn't it? It is so long. (laughs) Just call it ICNM and and make your life a lot easier. Yes. I just wanted people to understand what it was. So the PCRM ICNM, um, it was a wonderful conference and just full of so many amazing people like yourself. So, um, okay. Before we get into your story, which I cannot wait for everyone to hear, and it's just so inspiring. Um, remind me about your background on how you, Chuck, got into media. Oh, man. Uh, boy, I started at a very young age, um, kind of always wanted to do media. I was either going to be a professional baseball player, a professional wrestler, or go into media. And uh, with my athletic ability severely limited, um, I decided to go the media route. And so really right out of high school, I kind of started as just a promotions schlub and uh, just carrying heavy equipment from event to event, and then spent all of my off time in the actual studios bugging the DJs to teach me. And so I just acquired more and more and more knowledge and would come in there and all of my off time unpaid, just learning and soaking everything up until I got a break as a producer and then just kept climbing the ladder until eventually uh, wound up doing uh, like a wacky morning sidekick thing on a classic rock station and then graduated into sports journalism and then regular news and then eventually health media. And so that's 20 years in a nutshell. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that was 20 years ago. Okay. So speaking of the sports media, I'm thinking about that's where you got your, your nickname, the weight loss champion, right? Like tell me a little bit about how you got that nickname. Yeah. So right after I lost, uh, the majority of the weight, I got this surge of confidence and I founded my own sports media company because I had grown up a huge sports fan and I wanted to parlay the experience that I had into covering sports. So I got credentialed to cover the NFL team here in Washington and uh, wound up doing a radio show with one of the players there, a gentleman by the name of Adam Carricker. I owe a lot to him as far as my career. And uh, he was a, a big time defensive. And I mean, this guy was just enormous, like six, six, three and a quarter, just pure muscle. One of the strongest people I've ever met in my entire life. But anyway, those guys in the locker room, they're so enamored by nutrition and health because of their own profession. You know, they take it very seriously. So when word got around that I had lost all of this weight, he coined me the weight loss champion. And I, that's a name that I would never in a million years give myself, but growing up such a sports fan, I kind of was like, I'm just going to run with this. Even though it was uncomfortable at first, I'm going to run with it because I I just thought it was so cool that an NFL player gave me that name. And, you know, I had his respect enough to give me that name. I was like, I got to use it. I absolutely have to use it. So that's, that's, um, that's a big feather in the cap that I'm I'm so grateful that he gave me that name because it's kind of cool, right? Heck yeah. And you know, then you stepped into that. It's like when somebody maybe of that stature or that you look up to deems you as a person that maybe you didn't see yourself as being, it gives you permission to step into that, which is super awesome. And now you own it so well and you're living it. And it's, that's a cool story. I love that. So, okay. And you were at what age when he did that? Uh, I was in my 
probably late twenties at that point, maybe 29, maybe 30, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. So take me back to the beginning of your story with food addiction, because I listened to the weight loss summit with chef AJ and you know, there's a lot that goes into food addiction. I have never been like overweight or morbidly overweight or obese. However, I totally understand food addiction because I've been there. I've gone through the drive through I've done all of that without feeling like I had any control. So I want to know, I want to know your story. And I want to know if there was a particular time in your life that you can recognize that really was, you were totally pulled into the pleasure trap. Oh yeah. There, there was one defining moment, but you got to go back 20 years before you can even get to that defining moment. And, and that starts with where the seeds were planted. And that was at a very, very early age where, you know, my mom, single mother didn't have a whole lot of time, didn't have a whole lot of money growing up. Um, so dinner for us was often at the drive through something quick, something cheap, something convenient. And I remember specifically going to the Burger King drive through couldn't have been but second or third grade already getting double cheeseburger, ketchup only, get the combo meal with the biggest fries and the biggest drink possible. Um, and I would just polish all of that off and still be ready for more. And so that was uh, after, by the way, going to my grandma's house, my brother and I would after school and she would feed us uh, like we were, you know, uh, she, <laughs> she used to say grandma loves to watch her boys eat. And God knows she got that show every single day because she would feed us like everything that we didn't think twice about it at the time, but now thinking back, I just kind of shudder, you know, it was like hot dogs and baked beans and Lay's potato chips. And if there was going to be any vegetable other than the baked bean, uh, it was going to be, <laughs> it was going to be ketchup. Or uh, if we were going to be really healthy, a can of creamed corn um, mm -hmm. on top of, you know, or fried bologna sandwiches on white bread with American cheese and mayonnaise and uh, French fries. And it didn't matter really what she was cooking on top of the stove either. There was always going to be bacon grease in it because she had this jar of bacon grease that she kept on top of the stove, didn't cover it or anything. I mean, this thing was just out in the open so that, you know, couldn't be healthy for so many reasons, but we'll just take a scoop of it and cook whatever it was with this bacon grease. And then drain the grease back into the jar after she was done cooking. And so like you're getting like this double shot of fat on top of fat. And then you go to the drive through after that. So by a very young age, like my mind didn't recognize it at the time already very much became a fan of salt and fat and was never much of a sweet guy, but boy, that salt and fat that stuck with me. And so as I grew older and my body grew larger the portion sizes increased more and more and more and more, but I never even took time to think about the addiction component because it just became normal to me. Like this is what I would eat, mm -hmm. yeah. but then you're asking about the defining moment. And that came when I was working uh, as that wacky morning show sidekick on uh, WBIG, believe it or not, big 100.3 oh, here in Washington, DC. And uh, I, I was playing this big Chuck persona. By this point, I was well north of 300 pounds, probably in the 350, 360, maybe even 370 range. And this company called The Cookie Diet came in and they were looking for someone to endorse their product. Well, you know, who else are they going to get to do it? But big Chuck, because I've got weight to lose. So I started this, this cookie diet and I really wanted to do my best because they were paying me to lose weight. And obviously, you know, I had a big cheering section at the station. Everybody wanted me to succeed. And so I, I really tried, you know, those first couple of days to, to do my best. And so what the cookie diet was, was they give you two cookies to eat, one for breakfast and one for lunch. And you eat these things and you drink a whole bunch of water with them. And they're supposed to expand in your stomach and keep you full until your next meal. The cookies, by the by, we can talk about this. They did not taste like cookies. They tasted like garbage and that's that. But then you kind of had a little bit less restriction with dinner. They just said, you know, eat a sensible dinner, that ambiguously defined sensible dinner. They don't tell you what that is. Just make sure that it has a lot of vegetables, whatever. So 
sensible to me at that time was like uh, white chicken breast, no skin, and then maybe, you know, some roasted potatoes and then, you know, vegetables that were probably lathered in butter and a, and a ton of salt. So nothing really healthy was on that plate. But the first day I was okay. Second day, I got a little bit cranky and started to feel a little bit sick, right? Because all I could think about, my mind was just fixated on going to Taco Bell because I was used to going to Taco Bell at this point and throwing down $20 every single time I went through the drive through for one person, $20 worth of food. And I loved it. I lived for that. I planned my day around going to the freaking drive through But then here I am two days out and I'm starting to get cranky and angry and starting to feel really kind of sick. So that second night I was like in the bed, kind of covered up, like feeling like I got the flu the third day, like, don't talk to me because I'm going to bite your head off. Okay. Just don't talk to me. Don't look to me. Don't interact with me. I'm going to stay downstairs in my room and I don't want to see you bottom line, end of story. But then as the day built and I got home from work, the rage just grew and grew and grew. And so I just like got up and I Boom. And I put my fist through a wall because I didn't get, you know, like my brain was just freaking out because I wasn't getting fast food. And then boom, I put my fist through a door because, well, that's going to make it all better too. If the wall didn't do it, certainly the door would No. So then I get back in bed, I'm feeling sick and everybody knows to avoid me because we've got this Jekyll and Hyde situation happening with my personality. So then after everybody goes to bed, I sneak out of the house in the middle of the night. And if this is a clandestine, uh, clandestine, what, what's that word? Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> this is a covert mission to Taco Bell in the middle of the clandestine. This is a clandestine mission to Taco Bell in the middle of the night that nobody was supposed to know about. And so I go and I pay my $20 and I get my fix and I come home. And I sit down and when I took that first bite from that seven layer burrito, it was like a warm rush of calm just washed over me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, literally, I could feel it from my head to my toes. When I say it washed over me, that's exactly what it felt like, like a wave was crashing and just submerging me in this. And that's when I realized, holy crap, I've got a real problem here, a Mm -hmm. real, real, real problem here. If this is like eliciting that type of emotion from me and this is food, no freaking wonder I'm close to 400 pounds. No wonder I'm in such bad shape here. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there pondering that, but couldn't help myself. So I continued to eat and started to cry, you know, because not only did I get the sense of calm and relief, but then this realization like, oh man, I'm in a battle now. Mm -hmm. And I just started to weep because I didn't know what the heck to do. And so that, that was my introduction to food addiction. And I was probably like 24. Yeah. About 24 at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, well, you know what? I have to give you props because I feel like when I went through the drive-thru, there was no way that it made it to where I was going. It went into my mouth, like (laughs) (laughs) the moment that it got into my car. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But like, I did, I didn't want anybody to see me eat. Like there was also this sense of shame that came with it. So, you know, whether I was supposedly trying to be good with the cookie diet, or it was just an ordinary day, I didn't like to eat in front of anybody because I knew that I had this problem. You know, I was, I was ashamed of my weight, didn't know that I was a food addict, but you know, I was still ashamed of my weight and just couldn't bear the thought of anybody staring at me and judging me. So I would just go down to my room in the basement and just do it binge by myself. Got it. Got it. I remember, um, a time I was like 19 and had just met my now husband and we, we both went to like GNC. We went to the, we, we got a gym membership. We went to GNC. He bought weight loss pills. I bought pills that, um, I was trying to like rev my metabolism up. Um, and there were probably like meal bars and stuff like that in that, you know, in the mix there. And I was in a really bad place because I was looking at food 
like the, the cookie diet, for instance, like these, these diets, these fad diets that are giving people false hope and, and, and things that they cannot sustain are so poisonous. I mm. feel like in our culture and it's so it's just setting people up for such a bad cycle and a bad relationship with food and to look at food as like, Oh, I only get this little bar. This is my meal. You know, it's like that scarcity and it's just, it's just bad. So yeah. I'm glad that you, you broke away from the cookie diet <laughs> and that, you know, I'm glad that you had that epiphany and um, that you're here today. So how did you save your life? How did you save your own life? Tell me more about after that point, what happened? Well, the sick thing is that it was still years after I reached this point before I made the decision that something had to change. I recognized that there was a problem, but there were no real changes implemented until three years later. I mean, that's the nature of addiction. You know, I don't think that an alcoholic, you truly need to tell that they have a problem. If you tell them that they do, they'll deny it, but they know daggone well that they do. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a food addict or a drug addict. So you just kind of deal with it, you know, for three years and, and you kind of figure out a way to put yourself into denial and um, like food psychology, that's a whole other issue that we could talk about for hours, but just the level that I would go to, to make excuses for not making changes to justify uh, my continued eating habits. Um, and it's not like it even needed justifying, but I guess it's just a better way to explain it was excuses that I would make to make myself more comfortable, or at least try to trick myself into saying that this is okay, you're doing okay. You know, whether it be recently, I was talking on another episode of the exam room, uh, we were talking about healthy at every size. And I use the analogy, well, you know, when I was still overweight, if Nike was making workout gear that was in, you know, my size, so I was wearing like 66 inch waist pants at my heaviest and a size six X shirt. If I could find workout gear in that size, I would say that I'm healthy because you equate workout gear with being healthy. And if they make workout gear in your size, ergo, you are healthy. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. But these are the kind of mind games that I would play with myself so that I would not have to force the reality that change was necessary. Mm -hmm. But what forced me to accept that reality was the fact that my health began to deteriorate very quickly. Now, I had had high blood pressure. I was on high blood pressure medicine since I was 14. But when I was about 25, 26, that was when my heart really started to scare me. Like I couldn't walk more than 10 feet, 15, 20 feet without my chest beginning to tighten. Um, and like the color draining from my face. And I would just like start to sweat profusely. And all I could think about when this would happen was that analogy that, you know, it felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest at the time they were running TV commercials. I'm sure for some sort of heart medication mm -hmm. talked about an elephant sitting on your chest. And I was like, holy crap, that's what's happening with me. And so like, that was really scary having to stop every 10 feet to catch your breath and then walk another 10. And the same thing would happen because my grandfather on my father's side died before I was even born from a series of heart attacks. And by this point, also, my father was also experiencing heart issues. And so I knew that I was definitely following in their footsteps, but I was on the accelerated plan because of the way that I was abusing my body at that point. So I had a lot of things that I still wanted to do in life, personally, professionally, still being very young in my 20s. And I was like, if I do not change, there is no way that I'm going to live to see 30. And mm -hmm. so like, again, it took me a little bit more time to, to really come to grips with that. But then you, you tell yourself that enough, that's a pretty powerful motivator, like just being able to stay alive and like no longer being able to pull the wool over your own eyes, whether or not you can find that six X workout gear, you know, it's, right. it's like crap, man, I want to live. I got to do something and I got to do it now. Yes. Oh my gosh. Hey friend, before we get too far into this episode, I want to be sure you know about how the environment plays a role on your overall health. 
For over a decade, I've been learning so much about the lack of health regulation in the personal care and food industries. And that's actually one of the reasons why I started this show. You deserve to know how to protect you and your family from unwanted body burden. And I share further information about how to make better choices and vote with your dollar in our private Facebook community called The Urban Pharmacy. On that note, I wanna let you know about one of the easiest ways that we've switched to safer, and that's through my favorite clean beauty brand called Beauty Counter. Your skin is your largest organ and what you put on it every day matters a lot. And with a low carbon footprint, cruelty-free formulations and high performing results, I haven't found a better beauty brand than Beauty Counter in over five years of working with this mission-driven brand. To learn more and shop clean, head to mybetterbeauty.com. Okay. So you ended up getting surgery. I did. Was that prior to any lifestyle changes? Uh, yeah. So, (laughs) yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was, um, I, I did not know what else to do. So at this point in my life, I am completely unfamiliar with the idea of a plant-based diet. Um, did not, you know, the word vegan probably wasn't anywhere even on my radar. And if it was, I'm sure I just equated it with, you know, uh, hippies burning sage sticks and, you know, smudging their house and, and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, fun things. But, um, of course, you know, as you learn over time, nothing could be further from the truth. So, uh, I wound up having the surgery because that is what my father had. My stepmother had, I had a friend who had had the procedure and they had, short-term success. All of them lost a tremendous amount of weight, but then began to put it back on, but they were like, you need to do it. You need to do it. You need to do it. So to me, the surgery became kind of like this latest fad diet, Mm -hmm. but it was a fad diet that was sure to work at least for the short term. And that would buy me time. It would buy me a couple more years, but I could at least say that I had gone to my grave having tried everything. So I had the procedure literally um, began on my 27th birthday. And um, I, I, I <laughs> boy, yeah, man. I mean, that, that set my life on a completely different path that I was not expecting whatsoever. Um, but I will say, um, I, I will address this up front. I do every time that I, I talk about my story is like, there's a misconception that the surgery is an easy way out and it is not. And I encourage you please to go look at any study out there about the long-term success rate of these surgeries. And you will see that it is very much similar to uh, any of these fad diets, whether it's Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or keto or South beach or whatever. Um, you know, it does not train you to change your lifestyle. And because your stomach is a balloon, it's very elastic. It can expand back out. And so pretty soon you're going to be able to eat those same quantities of food. And if you don't make the changes that are necessary between your diet and your lifestyle, man, you're going to go right back to the surgeon's office. Matter of fact, they tell you the day that you walk in there for consultation, how crazy is this? They tell you that day that if this surgery doesn't work, if you put the weight back on, don't worry, you can come back in for a revision surgery where essentially they would staple your stomach for a second time. I remember you saying that. that? Yeah. Yeah, And it's, it's like, oh my God. But that also was like, that was a little bit like those excuses that I used to play like, oh, well, they've just given me permission to continue on this path. So we'll do this. And then after this, I can go back to the drive-thru. And then after that, then then I can make the changes that I need to make uh, for a lifetime. But the long-term success rate, man, it is not, not that good. So that's, but it that's helped basically. you, it helped you get to, to your next step. So for you, it was a, it was a success. It was a, it was a small success to help you get to that next step of lifestyle change, which is really where all the, the change happens. Right. So you were talking about fad diets and, the short-term rapid weight loss, such as the ketogenic or meal replacement shape shakes and, um, the psychology behind that. Can you explain a little bit more just from your personal experience, why those 
are going to hinder sustainable weight loss for people. Well, for the, I mean, just sustainable weight loss and those types of programs are not synonymous with each other. I mean, they are meant to be short term solutions to a lifelong problem. And that is the problem, right? Because you need a lifetime solution for a lifetime problem, right? Otherwise, it's the whole square peg round hole analogy. It's just never going to fit. So people set these goals for themselves. It really, to me, begins with mentality, right? So you begin with a goal of losing, say, 20 pounds, right? Wonderful. You got 20 pounds to lose. Let's do it. But the problem is when you start these programs, it's like, how quickly can I get the 20 pounds off and how quickly can I go back to eating the way that I was? And so if your reward is going back right to the, your starting point, it's like, what kind of reward is that? You know, we reward ourselves with the very thing that put us in that position in the first place. That does not make any sense to me. Um, but we don't realize that at the time. And so like, that is the problem with these things, right? So, um, you know, uh, and, and they really do not teach you. They're not designed to teach you about making sustainable lifetimes worth of change. They're just mm -hmm. not. And, and I don't care how you lose the weight in all honesty. I really honest to God, do not care how you lose the weight. It's about what you do after you've lost it to sustain it. Mm -hmm. And what those diets do not provide is that sustainability because they are meant to be short-term solutions. They are meant to be cash cows. They are meant to have you be a returning customer. They don't want you on this program one time. Heck no. They want you to keep coming back, coming back, coming back, lose it, gain it, lose it, gain it, lose it, gain it. And guess what? You do that three times, boom, they've got you for three memberships and probably a few thousand dollars, right? So that's how that works. And it just drives me up the freaking wall. But if you do it, you do it once you lose the weight, man, just take a step back and rethink what it is that you want to do with your life. Rethink how it is that you have been living. And then, and then that can help you make wiser decisions about how it is that you're going to plot your course to move forward. Otherwise you're going to be right back buying another membership to Jenny Craig there in about a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So plotting your course, where along this course of yours, did you decide to go vegan? Mm. You know, was that like at the same time as you connecting with PCRM? Yeah. Um, the, being vegan actually came along a number of years after uh, the surgery. And what happened between then and my introduction to the whole plant-based lifestyle was, um, one, fast food became the enemy. I recognized that very quickly. Um, that I did not want to go back for that second surgery. And I was like, if I'm going to take this radical step to make a change, then it's going to be a lasting change. And I'll be damned if I'm going to do it a second time, because I woke up from that procedure feeling like garbage. So really the biggest thing that I did was not to eat fast food anymore. Like that's kind of where it started. Like it's a simple thing, but because you have this procedure and you, you, can't even give into it for that three to six months following it, or else you'll get like really, really sick. You get this, this window essentially where you can reset your eating habits, um, as your body adjusts to being, um, adjusted the surgery. So I just decided after that window was up, like I'm, I'm never going back. Like I remember the day that I was discharged from the hospital, uh, coming home and fell asleep. But when I woke up, I saw a cup of coffee from McDonald's sitting right next to my bed. And it was just a black cup of coffee, right? So virtually no calories in there. I think there's like five in a, in a whole cup of black coffee. Um, but the golden arches, man, they made me angry. Like just seeing that I was like, why in the hell would anybody bring this into my room, knowing that it was these arches? that put me here in the first place, right? Like I want nothing to do with it. I don't care if it's a cup of coffee. I don't care if it's one of their salads or a bottle of water. The fact of the matter is it came from McDonald's. That is the enemy. So that's kind of the mentality that I adopted with every fast food place. So that's where I started with that. And then, you know, that just grew over time. And I, I just started adopting more and more information, acquiring it about what it meant to eat healthy. And then by this point, I was into sports journalism. So here's, here's the introduction, right? Long winded, uh, 
question or a long-winded answer to a short question. I was doing the radio show with Adam Carricker, who had given me the name, the weight loss champion. And our agent at the time, his wife actually worked for the physicians committee and they were looking for people, uh, to athletes to participate in their program uh, that they were calling teaming up for health. And so it was all about eating a healthy diet. And so even though I wasn't plant-based, but I was eating a ton of fruits and vegetables and, and Adam was very much a health nut too, because his wife, uh, very much into nutrition, they chose us to participate in this campaign. So this was my introduction to them. Um, and you know, everybody's talking plant-based, plant-based, plant-based. And like, <laughs> it's, I feel so goofy about this now, but like, I was still eating, like thinking like lean chicken was healthy. And so like they had this big event up on Capitol Hill and I get invited to go and share my story there on Capitol Hill. And so like, you have like these three Olympians for God's sakes, three <laughs> Olympians on the panel talking about how a plant-based diet has like gotten them to Olympic gold. Right. And then here I am, you know, just this like radio sports journalist, dude. And I'm like, yeah, you know, and, and I'll go for a run now. And then I'll go right to the salad bar at whole foods and I'll load up on a whole bunch of vegetables and chicken. And it's just like, oh God, like looking back now, I just cringe at that. Right. But I didn't know, but I'm so grateful that I was there anyway, because that was my introduction. And so I kind of, I tucked away all of the information that I learned that day and remembered these guys. And so years later, after I had graduated on from sports and was doing regular news and just kind of got burned out by covering death and destruction all day, like there's mm -hmm. only so many murders you can cover and house fires and seeing the trauma that these families are going through and having covered the riots in Baltimore, like firsthand and like witnessing that pain, like that takes a toll on you mentally. Right. And I wanted to feel as good physically uh, or as good mentally as I did physically. And I was just so ready for a change. And so I, I approached the physician's committee about the idea of doing this podcast, the exam room, and they loved it and they went for it. And in between time, uh, I had also done this interview with a professional wrestler by the name of Austin Aries, who had just released a book about how he was plant-based and how that fueled his career. I mean, this is a guy who wrestled at WrestleMania, right? I mean, like that's huge. Even if you're not a wrestling fan, you know, WrestleMania. And so like, this is like enormous. So if he's telling me that, and he's had this level of success, certainly there's something to it. So I gave it a try and man, I felt fantastic all over inside and out. And so then we get rocking and rolling with the exam room and kind of the rest is history. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. What a, what a like step-by-step -step, you know, journey that you've been on. And when, when, it, when you transitioned from, I mean, you didn't really transition from, I guess the standard American diet to a plant-based diet, you, you were eating more healthfully or what you thought was more healthfully, right? Um, was it hard for you to replace the animal products that you were eating with non-animal products? Like, did you switch to, you know, what did it look like for you? Was it plant-based um, replacements such as like in a package or were you making everything homemade? Did you go from like chicken to tofu or was it just beans? Like, what did that look like for you? It, it was, uh, it was kind of a, a, a mm. It wasn't, you know, like hardcore overnight. So there was kind of like graduating into, you know, the, like the Gardein products. And mm -hmm. I, I wasn't there for very long before I went into the more whole food uh, route, especially as I began to learn on the exam room. I was like, oh, okay, well, we can do this much better. And so like, it really was a short amount of time before I was like going like really super healthy, but there, there was a graduation process just as there was when I was losing weight initially, right. Didn't know anything about nutrition. So, you know, part of that process was eating a whole lot of Metafast bars and, and those shakes and things that we were talking about. And so you graduate from there. And then, you know, like I wound up at my 10th high school reunion, <laughs> this girl who I had a crush on, like she's became a nutrition nut. And so she wanted to talk to me and we became, you know, really close and started dating. And then she really schooled me up on nutrition, but she was not plant-based at all, but she really took me in that cleaner direction. So I was kind of ready and it was easier for me to make this transition to plant-based when the time came. 
But um, the hardest thing, though, that I had, it wasn't giving up meat. It wasn't the meat substitutes or anything like that. I was a dairy junkie. Now, I had already taken I had already taken cheese off of my menu because it was so high in fat, mm -hmm. but I was drinking skim milk like it was going out of style. Like, I mean, literally drinking close to a gallon of that a day. And so giving that up was really the hardest thing at first. But after a couple of weeks, you know, I was pretty cool and had discovered uh, unsweetened almond milk by that point and, uh, and was doing okay. Um, I knew yeah. that I didn't want to drink the almond milk that had a ton of sugar in it or anything like that, but mm -hmm. the almond breeze, vanilla, unsweetened uh, almond milk to this day is, is definitely one of my favorites, but the dairy was, was hard. Everything else was relatively easy. Once you kind of knew what you were doing, it, it wasn't hard at all. Yeah. Um, I totally hear you on the, on the dairy situation. Um, wow. That was my addiction for sure. Especially mm -hmm. when I went plant-based, I was so worried about getting enough protein. So I thought I had to have tons of dairy for that. You know, I had no idea. And, um, I was, I was going through, I don't know if you remember when like all the, the frozen yogurt joints opened where you could put all the different toppings on. I would go there multiple times a day. I was like a yogurt, a frozen yogurt, because again, like, I think I was, I was eating pizza because it was like 18 or 19 that we went on our first date. Uh, I was, it was way long ago and I got pizza. We, me and my husband, my now husband split a pizza. I wasn't eating the cheese at that point. He was eating cheese and pepperoni on the other half. So I had, I had ditched the cheese, but I vividly remember that low fat frozen yogurt multiple times a day with like cereal and sugar. So it was like this, it was the sugar and the fat or the sugar and yeah, a little bit of fat. And there was still a little bit of fat. It wasn't fat free, but just, I was so addicted to it. And then all of the toppings that you could put on, oh my word, I was eating ridiculous amounts of what was deemed low fat dairy that I would put a whole bunch of fattening stuff on top of. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, yeah, dairy's hard, you know, has those casomorphins and it hits that dopamine response and it just is like, oh my gosh. So I hear the same thing. And then, yeah, I, I started getting, um, the unsweetened like almond milks and stuff like that. And I would add, you know, I would add maybe some maple syrup or, or stevia and get it sweet like that. And now if I'm going to drink a, a non-dairy plant-based milk, usually I make my own or have unsweetened soy milk. And it's like, I don't miss the sweetness, but it's been a journey for that. Okay, Chuck, I have like rapid fire questions that I want to, I want to dig into. We'll try to Bring do, up. we'll Bring try up. our best to do rapid fire. Okay. Do you find yourself eating the same foods day in and day out and feeling satisfied? How much do you vary your menu? Uh, very much day in and day out. I've always been a creature of habit, whether I was significantly overweight or now that I'm maintaining this weight loss, I love to eat the same thing every single day and I just never get tired of it. I still get as much pleasure out of it now as, as I ever did. So it's very much the same thing day in, day out. Very structured. Got it. And where can somebody begin to make their food delicious and interesting, especially when they host a lot of parties. I fielded this question from one of my clients actually, and she, she's fearful of the plant-based lifestyle, although it's no different than any healthful lifestyle, um, really in terms of eating, but she's fearful that her food isn't going to be delicious and interesting. And she's just, that's, that's like one of our hugest, her biggest setbacks. So how do you make your food delicious or how did you, I mean, I know you're probably super whole food, like enjoy a piece of broccoli. Like I do plain right now. It's yeah, delicious, yeah, but yeah. what are your tips? Well, so number one is you're going to have to just kind of get over the fear. And I know that that's easier said than done. Um, but there are so many fantastic whole food, plant-based recipes out there that will knock anybody's socks off. And you don't even have to tell your guests that they're not eating 
uh, anything other than vegan items. You really don't like, that's the cool thing. If you make it and it tastes good enough, they're not going to question. They're going to come at you for the recipe. They're not going to notice that you don't have meatballs out. They're not going to notice that you don't have that platter of, of meat. They're not going to notice any of that. They're just going to notice the taste and it's great and be like, Ooh, what is this? So you're going to have like this exotic menu and they're going to want to come back for more. So the fear is definitely understandable, but spend a little time, you know, on a weekend before you have to host trying out some of these recipes. And I'm telling you, you have nothing to be afraid of. It's so much easier actually when you're hosting and you're in charge of the menu, as opposed to going over to somebody's house where you're not in charge, right? So you're kind of at their mercy. And then you have to plan ahead and bring your own stuff, but that's a whole other question. But when you're in charge of the menu, it's so much easier. So just take a little bit of time, you know, a week or so ahead, test out some of these recipes. And I'm telling you, they're easy to make. And every single person in your life who you will ever connect with will say, holy jeepers, this is fantastic. Yes, I love that. I love that idea of trying the recipes first. That would definitely take a lot of the fear out of the situation. If you know it's delicious, you can have super full on confidence when you're serving it to other people. Absolutely. Um, okay. Do you practice intermittent fasting or time restricted eating or eating an, an eating window for you and your long-term, you know, weight loss sustainable plan? Is that part of your plan? This may surprise a whole lot of people, but the answer to that is no, uh, I do not. Uh, I eat pretty much in, in regular intervals, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, with mm -hmm. a couple of snacks thrown in there. So, you know, just as I eat the same thing, kind of every single day, it's like at the same time, it's the same thing. And it's just kind of my routine. And clearly I feel like it's really worked for me. I don't necessarily feel like I need to do any fasting to lose any more weight. Matter of fact, I'm at a point where I should not lose any more weight. So, uh, no, I, I don't do fasting, but my hat's off to you. There's a lot of science that says that it's great. And so if that's what you feel like you need to do, then you got my blessing, go ahead and do it. Got it. Okay. What does a typical day look like for you, Chuck? What do you eat? So in the morning, it is always uh, oatmeal uh, with frozen fruit on top. And right now I'm on this kick where it's frozen strawberries, frozen blueberries, frozen bananas, and then uh, fresh watermelon. Kind of like, well, why is everything, you know, like frozen and then the fresh watermelon? Have you ever had frozen watermelon? Like it's just not as good as the fresh, but those three... Uh, they freeze pretty well other than watermelon. So that's what I do there, um, typically with a cup of uh, green tea. And then uh, if I'm still hungry after that, you know, like a little bit of fruit, but it's usually uh, a big bowl of oatmeal, right? And so then at lunch, uh, it's typically um, a bunch of finger food. So it's like roasted Brussels sprouts, baby carrots, pita, gotta have hummus. You gotta have hummus. So with the pita, with the whole wheat pita, it's uh, roasted red pepper hummus with the vegetables. It's just that classic plain hummus. And if you're not making your own, if you can find kava in, in a mm -hmm. store near you, that's the one that you're going to want to get. It's going to cost you a little bit more, but man, is it good? And it does not have any oil. So that's the route to go. And then for dinner, man, it is kitchen sink salad time. All right. So that is when you get all the greens that you have in the refrigerator and you put that in a bowl and then you put some brown rice in that bowl. And then maybe you throw some quinoa in that bowl. And then you're like, all right, what other roasted vegetables do I have in the fridge right now. Oh, what's this butternut squash? Boom. Throw a handful of that in there. Oh, I still have more Brussels sprouts. Boom. Throw that in there. Asparagus. Boom. Throw that in there. Oh, well, I kind of feel like tomatoes tonight. Why don't we go ahead and, you know, do a, a couple of roasted uh, tomatoes in there. Boom. So I'll do that. Just roasted, 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 throw that on there on top of a bed of greens. Uh, and then I'll take a sweet potato and kind of like puree that a little bit. And as crazy as this sounds, like I will then swish everything around in that sweet potato. So that kind of becomes the dressing. And I mean, it's got to be thin. So maybe add just a splash of water, just a little bit, right? So, and that way it'll spread evenly. I mean, just a little bit, because if you overdo it, then you've got sweet potato water and you don't want to use that. That's no. So anyway, uh, that's, that's really what it is. And then uh, pita and hummus on top of that as well. And, and you're really good to go. And then uh, a snack, the snacks typically are like either um, like roasted garbanzo beans or 
you know, like I try really hard to avoid nuts, a lot of them anyway, because like that's that's something that I found that I still have a hard time controlling. So if there's a jar of peanuts in the house, like game over, like I, I just I don't have the willpower to deal with it. So I don't bring those into the house, but um, I will still do like almonds or Brazil nuts or something like that. Just a handful uh, or sometimes it's even more just baby carrots and, and, and hummus, you know, so it's it's really clean. It's really simple, but it's the same thing day in and day out. And I love it. Yum. And you know what? I, I totally agree with you with the watermelon on the oatmeal. I know that that sounds weird. I have never done it with frozen fruit, but I have, I love oatmeal with Swiss chard and watermelon. It's Mm. so good. I know it sounds so odd, but it's delicious. And yeah, with a little bit of pepitas on there, it's great, but I could totally do without the, the pumpkin seeds if needed. And I know it really does sound weird to put watermelon on your oatmeal, but it's a really good combination and everybody needs to try it. Yo, you piqued my interest with the Swiss chard on there. Like what is happening right now? Because, because Swiss chard naturally we're my husband and I own a farm and we sell at the farmer's market. And anyways, like just like celery, um, Swiss chard pulls a lot of sodium out of the, out of the soil. So it's just a naturally, like it's a natural, almost somewhat salty taste. And it gives the oatmeal like a really great flavor. And I love getting the, the rainbow chard and chopping up the stems and the greens and putting it through my oatmeal and cooking it just for a little bit, like at the end, it's so, so delicious. So it, it, it wilts down a little bit. It does. The, it totally okay. wilts down like really quickly. It does not take long, <sighs> put the lid on, let it steam in there. Like you can turn, turn the heat off and the, it'll steam quickly. And like the, sh- the, the shard stems are still a little bit crunchy. So it adds an awesome texture. Yo. It's really good. It's okay. delicious. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't I even know how I, I don't know how I came up with that. It was like, it was a total accident one day, but it it's, it's really good. Um, okay. So you said you don't bring the things in your house. I get that. We don't bring tortilla chips in the house anymore. We're done, done diggity. <laughs> I'm done with them. There's just no control. So what do you do? Here's a question from a listener. What do you do when you have a significant other or other people in your life? that are not on the same path or that are eating uh, more processed foods that you would definitely not put in your mouth. So a a couple of things that you need to remind yourself, like to me, the first thing I'm thinking about here is I'm wondering if this person is kind of feeling peer pressured to give in uh, or if it's even if they're not being offered the same food, are they dealing with cravings? So let's attack this from both angles just to make sure that we have it covered. Number one, if it is somebody in your life, uh, a friend, a family member, significant other, whatever the case may be, who, you know, is offering you this and probably with all well intention, like, oh, you can have just a little bit. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. They're not you. Okay. As close as you are to this person, they're not you and they will never understand completely what it is to be you. Only you know you and you know why it is that you're doing this healthier path. So you have to take a step back and be strong in your conviction. And remember that you know best, keep telling yourself, give yourself permission to make that decision. Don't let somebody else make a decision for you. You have permission, give it to yourself to make that decision and say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm going to continue to eat this way. We're good. And if they come back a second time, be a little bit firmer, like, nah, we're good. And you know what? They're going to respect you for it. Like it may feel a little bit awkward. Like you're going to feel like you, you, you want to fit in. So you should just have it. No, 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 no. Because you're going to feel bad giving in immediately. And then you're going to feel even worse later uh, when you have to kind of hit the reset on your diet and start from scratch because you give in once. My theory is you're going to give in again and again and again and again, because just as you had just given yourself permission not to give in. When you give yourself permission to give in, you have given yourself permission, carte blanche, to give in time and again. So that's a that's a tricky step. Just trust that you know best, listen to your gut, and you can get through it. Now, if this is just something that you're dealing with by observation, like cravings by proxy, here's what I do. And this goes for whether or not I'm with somebody who's eating something that would tempt me, or even if I'm just watching a ball game and a commercial pops on for Taco Bell and I get like this fleeting craving for a grilled stuff burrito. 
remind yourself that the craving is temporary. The craving is in fact temporary. Okay. The craving is going to last anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever the case may be. All right. But it will pass and it will pass relatively soon. But if you give into that craving, you will feel so much worse for so much longer. So a lot of people think, well, how do you deal with it? And, and, and they may be asking, how do you make it so you don't get these cravings? And you can't. Cravings are going to come, right? It's a matter of how you deal with it. So accept that you're going to have these cravings, ride it out for however long it takes, that five, 10 minutes, and you're going to be fine. And not only are you going to be fine, you're going to feel great because you didn't give in and you realize just how much power you have. And that, that, that gives you a lot of motivation to keep going on that healthier path. But if you do, you're going to feel like garbage because then you start feeling like you're weak and you're out of control and this will never work. And then it snowballs. And again, you're right back to where it was from the place that you started. So you don't want to do that. Just remember that you're powerful. The craving will pass and you will be just fine. Yes. I love that. Awesome. Okay. We're getting to the end. What are your long-term goals with health? Are you going to live for a hundred years or are you going to try to do a marathon? Do you have anything like that going on as far as like a big goal? Nah, I think if I was going to run a marathon, I probably would have done it already to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, I feel the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like a, lo a lot of people really get super into running afterwards, um, you know, on their journey and God bless them. Like I've, I've always been kind of a walking kind of a guy. Mm -hmm, yeah. My goal is, is more for sustained long-term health. So mm -hmm. I definitely, a hundred sounds fantastic. I'm in all honesty, most terrified of like cancer does run rampant in my family and so does Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's is really the big one for me because that is the thing that I'm trying to avoid the most. It's so funny. I begin on this weight loss journey and now it's kind of this crusade against Alzheimer's and it's, it's just been so heart wrenching to watch my grandmother go through it and her brothers and sisters. And so now, you know, my aunts and uncles are kind of just waiting with bated breath thinking, am I the next to get this? And there's a good chance because, you know, genetics being what genetics are and nobody really making that correlation between diet and lifestyle and Alzheimer's while they were growing up, they were eating the same things, you know, following in that same path. So that puts them at the higher risk for it. I want to avoid that. I, like I feel privileged to have acquired the information that I have now. So I'm doing everything in my power to make sure that I lower my risk as much as possible. And then mm -hmm. heart disease, um, certainly, you know, like I don't want to be like my grandfather. I don't want to be dead in my early fifties. I don't want to be like my other grandfather who had a series of heart attacks, but was ultimately died from cancer. You know, like I want to live a long and healthy life. I don't want to be like my father who has had a number of heart procedures now. So that's it for me. Like, I feel pretty confident, uh, not cocky about it, but confident that the weight is gone. So now it's kind of like a crusade to keep all of those chronic illnesses at bay mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm Alzheimer's is also something that I'm definitely trying to target. And thanks to the Sure's eyes, we've got a lot of good information that we can, you know, lean on with them too. And the physicians committee. Okay. So last two questions that I always ask people, where can we find you to stay inspired? How can we stay connected? Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the gram and Twitter at Chuck Carroll WLC, the WLC is weight loss champion. Um, so hit me up there. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, but the big thing is uh, the exam room podcast by the physicians committee. And uh, we do new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday on Apple podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. And then every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, we do things on YouTube. And then the Wednesday shows are particularly fun because those are our live Q and A's with the experts. So if it's not Dr. Neil Barnard, uh, we're going to have the Shure's eyes on uh, pretty soon. Um, my guy, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, author of fiber fuel. He comes on once a month. Like we've had a whole lot of just phenomenal experts come on and give uh, our listeners and our viewers the opportunity to ask them questions live on the show too. So um, that's a whole lot of fun. So really we're raising nutrition IQs and health IQs five days a week. And like, that's just, it's a ton of fun. So that's, if you're looking to raise your health IQ, that's the place to do it. It's 
the best. It's amazing. Okay. Here's the last question I ask everybody because this podcast and what I teach people is about this. So to you, Chuck, what does living a holistic life mean to you? It means being confident in who you are. It means accepting who you were and then realizing that you can be the best version of yourself possible. It means that you can go this healthy, holistic lifestyle, but it doesn't mean like, so for me, because I come from a sports world, it doesn't mean that you have to check your macho card. Right. So I think that the most macho thing in the entire world is to be who you are. Right. And so if you own that, I don't care what field your friends are in, they're going to respect you because you are sticking to yourself. Like that is confidence. And so like, to me, that holistic lifestyle, man, that is just like taking ownership of your health and being confident about it and leading by example. And so live cleanly, live happily, live healthfully and lead by example. And that's, love it. that's what it means. Yeah. I love it so much, friend. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Chuck. You are amazing. Thank you. I'm over here cheering you on because you just finished another episode of The Urban Pharmacy. For today's show notes, head on over to theurbanpharmacy.com and be sure to join us inside our private Facebook group called The Urban Pharmacy, where we share inspiration, live trainings, and holistic living tips to help you build community and the healthy lifestyle that you've always wanted. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button and please consider leaving us a five-star review. Before we connect again on the next show, follow me on Instagram at The Urban Pharmacy. That's urban with an H and pharmacy with an F. And I can't wait to hear your wellness journey as we get to know each other better. You know, there's truly no better time than now to level up your life. And I am so proud of you for showing up today. Until next time, be well, Health Crusader.